Welcome everybody. This is the second part of the Mongol lecture the Yu over the Yuan Dynasty as well as the early Ming Dynasty. We'll be discussing Mongol rule in China and the aftermath. So let's look at this timeline. Um, in 1209, Mongols begin their conquest of Northwest China. In 1215, Mongols conquered the Jin Dynasty. Um, the Jin Dynasty was in modern-day Manchuria. 1227, Ogadai becomes Great Khan, completes the conquest of North China, and unites uh, the Mongolian Empire. In 1230, he begins oppressive tax farming which um, hurts the peasantry in the country, countryside in 1265. Kublai claims to be the last Khan. And unlike the other Khans, he actually rejects um, other branches of Mongol rule. Um, so China kind of goes on its own trajectory at this point. In 1271, Kublai Khan, uh, he establishes the Yuan Dynasty. 1276, he conquers Southern Song Dynasty and begins to attack Northern Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam put up a great fight, and um, in 1283, it did become a tribute nation, and it had been prior to that. Um, however, the Mongols did not conquer Vietnam. 1274 and 1281, there were two failed invasions of Japan, um, both of them being um, intense weather, and the Japanese called it kamikaze, known as divine wind and saw it as divine intervention. Um, these um, invasions were very expensive for the Mongols and hurt the Yuan dynasty economically. In 1292, there was also a failed invasion of Java. This time they landed on the island, um, unlike Japan. However, um, weather as well as um, diseases um, forced the Mongols to leave within one year. Go ahead and take time and pause the slide and and think of the connections and the process of conquering over time in Asia. All right, um, this photo right here is, it actually has some irony in it. So the, the, if you look at the title within the image, it says repulse of the great Tartar invasion of Japan. But if you look at the citation, it says Tater. So let's talk about why. It's a little history behind this. So, um, Tater, T A T A R, was the Mongol word for a neighboring tribe that Genghis Khan had subdued. It was similar to the Mongol, Mo uh, Mongol Empire, however, they were Turkic. Um, the word Tartar is actually from the Greek word Tartarus, uh, meaning from hell or from Hades, and it was the word that Europeans used to describe the Mongols, and so that's why you see a, a difference here. Um, in this image, you see the um, in, the attempted invasion of Japan, and you can see the wind uh, coming in and saving, and so um, very important uh, background here in this photo. The Yuan Dynasty um, is going to occur from 1271 to 12, 1368. It is a synthesis of Mongol and Chinese culture. And, um, for example, Kublai Khan gave his son a Chinese name and a Confucianist education. When he made laws and public announcements, he took Confucian views into account. And he used Confucian rites of ceremony to legitimize his um, reign. Um, but all, all of the following visited his courts, the Buddhist monks, the Taoist priests, and many sages. And sages are actually um, people who are supposedly very wise, uh, what we usually refer to as philosophers. Here in this map, we see Beijing, and Beijing at this time was known as the Forbidden City because all those not part of the... Uh, royal family, the Khans, were not allowed into the enclosed palace. Um, the palace was so large, it actually um, had a town. Um, one of the reasons why the 
um, Mongols moved their capital from Karakoram over to Beijing was because they saw Karakoram as too remote once they established legitimacy over in China. China at this time was not unified culturally. They had many different languages, writing systems, forms of government, and elite culture. So take a look at the map and you can see how there are many um, overlapping um, empires that the Mongols conquered. Important to note, there are many changes in the social hierarchy during the Yuan Dynasty under Mongol rule. For example, there's a decline of Confucian scholars and government posts are no longer available to old Chinese elite, so they turn to commerce. This led to a rise of merchant status, which led to new privileges. Also, there was a rise of doctor status, which led to new privileges as well. For economics, there was increased prosperity in China due to North China being on the caravan route to Beijing. The interior had the Grand Canal. If you look at... Um, the Grand Canal, you can see how it connects up uh, the south up to uh, Beijing. Notice how it connects the southern um, Yangtze River up to the Yellow River. This is important because in this area was the rice growing region and up here in the north was the millet growing region So and wheat. So what would happen is the north can now send millet and wheat to the south and the south can now send uh, rice up to the north and this is important because um, the, they're going to receive a new crop, a new strain of uh, fast ripening rice over from Champa in Vietnam. This is going to allow a tremendous increase in the population um, specifically for the peasantry. Um, also along the coast, which is still by the way very important today, along the coast it's used for maritime, which means um, sailing, um, grain shipments from southern China. So they were also um, shipping um, grain um, back and forth. Um, however, the economics did not improve with Japan because the Mongols decided after their failed invasions that they would cut off trade with Japan. So ja Japan kind of becomes isolated in this time period. It's also a failure of paper money and copper coinage, which the Mongols had tried to um, push on the people. There is a rise in cottage industries across the countryside. An example would be the cultivation of mulberry trees. Um, after the Mongols ruled for a while, the countryside went into a decline because the Mongols imposed higher taxes on the peasantry. Um, through the tax farming, which led to uh, a rise of evictions, um, also led to servitude as people um, sought um, the protection and, and uh, a place to live with the wealthy elite. Um, there was a rise of homelessness. Um, the Mongols began to neglect the dams and the dikes, which led to flooding, and so there's a decline of the population. Some historians speculate up to 40% of the population um, was decimated due to warfare, female infanticide, uh, bubonic plague, refugees, and flooding. Another reason for the decline of the Yuan Dynasty was bacterial invasion, which was the Black Death, which spread across many trade routes from China over towards um, the other part of Eurasia um, led to a lot of chaos. Some areas were hit very hard and up to 90% were killed by the plague. Um, due to this, the Mongols lost the Mandate of Heaven and we talked about the Mandate of Heaven beginning with the Zhao Dynasty which legitimized um, the dynasties. If you were not doing a good job, it was said that according to the Mandate of Heaven that you will be replaced. And so there were several bandit uh, groups formed. One of the religious groups formed um, in opposition to the Mongol rule was the Red Turban Movement. And they're going to be important in a few more slides, so we'll get back to them. Um, but there was a, a need for a strong military takeover, which is about to occur. In the 1340s, there were many feuds among Mongol princes. In 1368, 
Hong Wu established the Ming Dynasty and he moved the capital from Beijing over to Nanjing. And as a result of the end of uh, Mongol rule, um, some Mongols decided to stay in China, uh, as well as the foreigners that they brought, including Muslims, Jews, and Christians. However, some Mongols returned to their homeland. Some adopted Islam, others Tibetan Buddhism um, over in Northwest China. The Mongols developed a renewed sense of unity, and Ming rulers did not gain control of all the Mongols. And some Mongols even paid tribute to China um, after the, the collapse of the Yuan Dynasty, and some continued to threaten the northern borders. Although we see a lot of negative impacts, especially on the countryside, there were some positive impacts of the Mongols' rule in China, including an increase in trade and exchange, except for uh, with Japan. Merchants could move freely between Eastern Europe to China due to the Mongols' passport policies, and um, there's a transmission of food, inventions, and ideas across the trade routes. We have seen and read about how Mongol women retain liberties, how they could be influential, especially in times of transitions. And Mongol patronage. Um, many scholars and artists from across Afro-Eurasia visited the Mongol courts. There was a religious toleration. You could be Buddhist, Nestorian, Christian, which actually considered um, heresy to Western Europeans. They accepted Latin Christians, Taoists, Muslims. Marco Polo was the most famous visitor to the uh, Kublai court. And um, some of the cities in China, he said that were they were the most beautiful he's ever seen. And he had seen many. Um, there's also a positive impact on the status of merchants and artisans which led to an increase in commerce. We move to the second part of this lecture where we transition from Mongol rule under the Yuan Dynasty to the early Ming Dynasty from 1368 to 1500. We will be covering later Ming Dynasty um, in uh, a, a few weeks. So let's go ahead and look at this uh, image here. It's called a fo poet on a mountaintop. We, we see in this artwork a relationship between the Chinese people and their environment. You can also see the calligraphy up in the left side of the drawing. Um, many Chinese um, artworks are known as um, landscape paintings, which we'll get into more when we talk more about the Ming Dynasty. So let's start by talking about Hang Wu, who established the Ming Dynasty. He was a Buddhist, but he maintained Confucian practices in order to gain legitimacy. He was very uh, weary of foreigners especially those from the Middle East and Inner Asia, and he limited foreign entry into China. He replaced paper money with silver. He established unhealthy economic practices um, of isolation that we've just discussed. He made Ming China more like the Yuan, but some continuities include the Mongol provincial structure as well as the calendar. What we know about Hong Wu is his um, taste of luxury, of, such as the imperial grandeur of the capital over at Nanjing. Um, he also used uh, marriage uh, to form alliances. He married the daughter of a leading red turban rebel, which we had discussed, who was trying to uh, unsuccessfully oppose the Mongols. Um, he consolidated power and removed a threat. Um, he actually initially ruled through his kinsmen by giving them land and local autonomy, but when they started to become corrupt and not uh, follow through, he took away their stipends and, and their privileges, and he decided to uh, uh, elect people who were not directly related to him or part of the royal family. He created an imperial bureaucracy, by reinstating the civil service exam and the Confucian school system. And so this demonstrates the continuity of Confucian ideas in Chinese culture and government. 
He rebuilt many irrigation systems. As we said previously, they have been neglected by the Mongols. Um, he uh, fixed over 40,000 reservoirs. Um, he also initiated a reforestation project and planted about 1 billion trees. Um, under the Ming Dynasty, we see China as the most highly centralized system of government of all the monarchies of this time period. For religion, Hong Wu revised and strengthened the elaborate protocols of rites and ceremonies, and so he made um, the public uh, ceremonies very elaborate, legitimizing um, his rule. He portrayed rulers as moral and spiritual benefactors of their subjects, and you see very many um, sacrificial rites which symbolize the relationships between humans and the spiritual world. We now move to Ming rulership. Conquest helped defend the bureaucracy and kept it functioning. Religion was not as important to the Ming as it was to Islamic dynasties, and so there's a comparison there for you uh, for AP World History. The rural areas were controlled through village chiefs, and one uh, example of a Chinese proverb in this time period was, the mountain is high and the emperor is far away. Social hierarchy in these local areas was based on age, sex, and kinship. However, Hong Wu slaughtered anyone who posed a threat. There were four purges, and he, over 100,000 people were executed. He would balance local sources of power with centralizing ambitions. The next empire, emperor is Yangon in 1403 to 1424. He moved the capital back to Beijing from Nanjing, reinstated his, the ties with the Middle East, However, Mongols continued to control land trade routes, and so as a result, many Chinese leaders turned to maritime routes. Central Vietnam, also known as Annam, which is the interior of Vietnam, continued to be a Chinese province, which demonstrated China's continuance of a policy of aggression. One of my favorite topics is the Forbidden City. So... After the movement of the capital from Nanjing to Beijing, Emperor, Emperor Yongle built a new capital, uh, even more grandiose than the one over in Nanjing. His palace had over 9,000 rooms, took over 100,000 artisans, and over 1 million laborers. And if you look at the image here on the right, you can see how um, this complex was... Um, created as kind of a, a city within a city and so uh, it, that's why it was called the Forbidden City because you weren't allowed in there unless you were royalty. Zhang Ha was a trusted imperial eunuch. A eunuch is a castrated male. He led seven naval expeditions from 1405 to 1433. He was a Muslim his parents were famous for um, going on the Hajj. He himself visited India three times, sailed to the Persian Gulf, Arabian coast, Horn of Africa, and Madagascar. And he established many entropots in Southeast Asia to ensure Ming allegiance and to collect taxes not to conquer. His expeditions were ended due to threats on the northern frontier, a focus on strengthening Beijing, and fighting the Mongols. A vacuum was left and occupied by Southeast Asia and Muslim traders. And by vacuum, in historical terms, refers to a space from which um, everything has been removed. The government began to limit mining, which led to an increase in the price of metal and a decline in the quality of metal, while Japan started to create better metal. This led to um, Japan surpassing China in high-quality swords, and there is a, a definite technological gap with Japan and Korea. Korea had better designed firearms, printers, and weather predictions. Um, although China invented uh, movable type, so those, that's an advancement in printing, Korea is the one who invented metal movable type. Um, China also was delayed in timekeeping and agricultural technology.
In addition to the decline in technology, during early Ming, China also experienced a decline in economics. There's a decrease in shipbuilding due to pirates. There is a revival of the exams, which led to the rise of scholarly gentry again after it had went on a hiatus. There's a reduction in commerce. There, but simultaneously is a population growth, and this creates a labor surplus and a growth of urban centers. This caused an increase in farming. Um, there's deforestation um, after all those trees were planted. By the 1400s, China's economy recovered because of political stability and long-distance commercial exchange. And China's recovery was essential for the revival of Afro-Eurasia's global economy following the Black Death. And so China was a major factor in the global economy um, through the 1400s. And lastly, we'll discuss some early Ming ach achievements. So there were a Chinese novels being written due to wealth from consumerism. Um, they actually had um, many, many bookstores. They had issues with piracy and, and uh, people um, copying each other's works. Um, one of the most famous Chinese novels written at the time was called Water Margin. However, um, it is debated on who is the the actual author. Um, China during this time period was known for its luxury trade and uh, such as porcelain and organizing its workers and and other goods such as lacquered screens and furniture and silk. Um, if you look to the right, you see a crown, um, and to the center, you see a lacquered dish. And to the left, you, bottom left, you see a lacquered screen. You usually see these in movies where someone is behind the screen and you can see their shadow. Or um, And then up at the top is a Ming vase. Um, so this is all for today. And we will be revisiting uh, the rest of the Ming dynasty in a few more lectures.